Okay, we want to do a uh, talk about the process by which God grows a leader, and uh, some of the things that, uh, uh, that that God wants to work in our lives in this regard. And uh, you've seen ball diamonds used for a lot of purposes, but this one is different uh, because it focuses on the on the, the, the your ministry, excuse me, personally, and so forth. So we're going to use the ball baseball analogy to talk about what we want to say to you today, okay? And the, the, those notes are there somewhere uh, in that packet. The Diamond Life is what it's called. The diamond Life. And in the, the, this, this kind of setting, we can, uh, you know, we can do some Q&A and, uh, and really bounce some things off each other, which is the best, the, the most enjoyable setting for me is when, when we can move from a talking head to so dialogue, and uh, in fact, that's what I'm going to focus on in the in the uh, session session this afternoon. Uh, I want to just deal with general issues related to church and life and ministry, and just uh, uh, do a major Q and A time in the next session uh, after lunch, where we can you know, you know some, you'd say you know here's something I'd, I'd like you to talk about or speak about or what this is a challenge I'm having uh, those kind of things we can do that in the after lunch session. All right, the pattern God uses to grow a leader. When you're doing all you can to realize the dream and it's dying, what is God doing? What is God doing? Joseph is the pattern by which we, we really learn the process that God takes us through to birth a dream and see that dream come to reality. Four basic arenas through which God grows a leader. Start with the first one, which is to win dependence. What the Lord wants to do in all of our lives is to bring us to that place of dependence on Him. To dependence on Him. When I graduated from Southeastern, I had all the answers. It's 42 years later, and I got all the questions. Here's what I discovered. Life and ministry is about knowing what the right questions are. It's about knowing what the questions are. And you can tell a pastor who hasn't hit the wall yet, who's seen success. You know, they kind of walk into district council a little cocky and arrogant, you know, at the little hitching their get along. You know, and, 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 here's, and here's their attitude. Well, you know, I don't understand why anybody can't grow a church. Nothing to it. A lot of these guys are, can't seem to grow a church. I mean, I, I've been able to do it. You know, no big deal. But, see, this is a guy who hasn't hit the wall yet. Because at some point along that journey, Pastor, you're going to come to a point where you don't know what to do. Where you come to that point where you, un where you begin to understand you know what, I don't know half what I thought I knew. At that moment, you're a candidate for what God really wants to do. It is dangerous for God to empower an unbroken person. I know more about ministry today than I've ever known, but I can tell you I feel more dependent on God today than I've ever felt. I was told that I would have children and I would feed them, clothe them, raise them. And one day they would be independent. I have two sons in their thirties. I'm still waiting. <laughs> and I have a dream. But don't mess with me after at lunch time about this. I have a dream that one night, me and my sons and their families are going to go out for dinner. And at the end of the meal, one of my sons will say, Dad, I'll pick it up tonight. I'm dreaming about that. You know, I, I, would, I, would, I would get encouraged if one of them just went for the wallet. Just a little encouragement now and then.
What the Lord is trying to do is get us from our thinking we got it all together, our self-sufficiency, back to a point where we can acknowledge to that Lord, I need you. If God's going to get you to where he wants you to be, he's got to bring you back to total dependence. What did God do with Joseph? Here's a 17-year-old with a dream, and his dream was everybody's going to bow down to him, and he was going to be the king kingpin. He's going to rule the world. Everybody's going to serve him. That was the dream. That's how he interpreted that dream. But God took him through some things that helped him realize how totally dependent he was on God. That's where God's got to get us. When to depend, <laughs> secondly, is to win within. The battle within us. The greatest challenge you have is you. You are the biggest problem you have. What's going on inside of you? you got to win the battle over self. You've got to win the battle of insecurity. You've got to win the battle of of all of those things that are robbing you of feeling, of being at peace with you. You can't be somebody else, you can only be you. And insecure leaders continue to sabotage their lives and their churches. Insecure pastors go through staff like water. I have a friend that I've been working with, he's very insecure. And he thinks every time a group of people in the back of the auditorium are talking that they're talking about him. I told him, I said, if you knew how little they talked about you, you'd really be upset. <laughs> I mean, you think you're the topic of everybody's conversation? I don't think so. Winning the battle over self and the discipline of self. My dad, who I, you had huge respect for a pastor for 55 years on this Gulf Coast, mainly in Alabama and Mississippi. I learned how to love people from my daddy. But I learned spiritual disciplines with the first pastor I worked with in Mobile, Alabama, Robert Spence, the man who's president of Evangel University today. That was the first place I, I worked in, in, as an associate when I come in, came out of college in, in Mobile. I did not know God was awake at four in the morning for people to pray. That's just foreign to me. This man was the most disciplined man I'd ever met. I learned how to love people from my daddy. I learned spiritual discipline from Robert Spence. Winning within. Winning the battle inside of you. If you're going to be the person God's called you to be, you've got to win that battle. Because we do more to sabotage ourselves than we do anything than anybody else does. The lies we believe impact our lives. And the insecurities we face are huge. I, a message I preached uh, a few months ago at the at a, a Living Free conference that was held at James River in Springfield. Uh, they've sold a lot of those, those DVDs of that meeting. But the Lord gave me a word regarding uh, the, the power of the Father's approval that I ministered that night. Because I really believe there are more men, men, people in ministry, men and women, who live with major insecurities because they've never gained gained or received approval in their lives from an earthly father. Let me tell you how important that is. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, having been baptized by John, that's, he, that's, how he, that's when he began his ministry. Three things happened in that moment, if you remember. There was a dove that descended upon him, representing the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the heavens were opened unto him. And the Father said, that's my boy, and I'm proud of him. 
before Jesus ever performed a miracle, before he ever did anything supernatural, before he accomplished anything in his earthly ministry, Father God said, that's my boy, and I approve of him. If Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, needed the Father's approval, so do we. I was fortunate enough to have a dad like that. I've got a friend who pastors in a neighboring district who I've known for 30 years. He and I have known each other for a long time. We went to youth camp together in Alabama. He's one of the most insecure pastors I know, and, and yet he's been successful to, to an extent. He would be considered a very successful pastor today, where he, where he does pastor. It, it, he's been successful in ministry, but he can't enjoy it because he's miserable inside. Because, because he never can do enough to feel like he's, he's done anything. And he has problems with staff, his pastoral staff around him. So he, he's been successful, but he can't enjoy it because he's so miserable inside. I know this guy real well. He called me on the phone a few months ago, and I was on the West Coast. And of course, he, so he woke me up at about 4.35 o'clock in the morning. He didn't know I was on the West Coast. He just... And when I picked, picked up my cell phone, I hear him on the other end of the line. He's crying. And I said, what's happened, man? What's going on? I thought maybe, you know, something happened to one of his kids or, or his wife or, or you know, what, what, some tragedy. What's going on, man? And he said, well, I had to call you this morning. He said, I was at the office this morning just getting there before everybody else did. And he said, I was just really crying out to God. And he said, Ron, I can't even describe you what happened. But he said, this morning, Father God walked into my office. You see, I know this man so well. His earthly father was three hours from him. If his earthly father would have ever gotten in a car and driven up to my friend's church, walked in his office and put his arms around his boy and said, son, I love you and I'm proud of you. My friend's insecurities would have disappeared in a moment. But the chance of his earthly father ever doing it is slim to none. And that morning on the phone, he said to me, Ron, God walked into my office this morning and he put his arms around me and told me he loved me. Something broke inside me. For the first time in 40 years, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. In the last few months, I've been totally different in his ministry. You got to win within. Whatever, whatever you need to deal with, what's going on inside of you, I'm going to urge you to say, God, help me. Whatever, if you need to follow to put his arms around you today, let's let it happen. Because he does love you and he is committed to you. Win within. Next is to win with others. Win dependence, win within, win with others. Ministry is about people. If you don't like people, you shouldn't be in a ministry. I mean, I know guys who said, you know, if it wasn't for the people, I'd enjoy the ministry. If you don't like people, if you don't enjoy being around people, if you don't enjoy interacting with people, you probably should go sell suits at Sears or somewhere. I think they're out of business, so you wouldn't succeed there very much. The ministry is about people, so why would we not want to continue to grow in our ability to relate to people and work with people? People skills. Win with others. You can't, you can't lead a church unless you can lead people. I know some pastors, they, they just have a gift. They can just walk in a room and make people mad. They just have a gift. <laughs> You've got to begin to win with others. You're going to be what God's called you to be. That's why I, I keep saying to our college presidents, you know, uh, we need to be teaching stuff about, about how, to, how to deal with, with people issues. 
Because you can't pastor if you can't deal with people issues. <clears throat> Next is win results. God wants to see results through your life and ministry. Results. And we'll talk about this as we continue to move forward. The new pattern that God established for us is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let me just read it again for your hearing. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't be conformed anymore to the world's pattern or the world's thought process, but let your mind be renewed to think like a kingdom person. So here's the rules of baseball. Let's get those out of the way. The bases stay the same, but the league of play changes, which means it's, it's always four bases, but it's always tougher as you continue to go up the, up the ladder. The other, here's the other rule. You score only when you cross home plate. Are you with me so far? You cannot score at home plate until you have covered first, second, and third bases. If you miss a base, you're called out. All this is important. Baseball is full of strikeouts and fresh starts. What do they call it when you run to the wrong base? Little League. There's a pattern, there's an order of the bases. The order matters, okay? So those are the ground rules for baseball. With that in mind, then, let's talk about this. Home plate is the place of calling. Winning dependence, the base, the connection of your life to the vine, your connection to the Lord. He is your source. He is your strength. It's that place of calling. Home plate is, is the calling place. It's getting on God's agenda. Recognizing apart from Him, we can do nothing. First base is the character base. It's being what God's called us to be. The first change the power of God is designed to make is not around you, it is within you, James says. The second base is the community base. It's winning with others, with people. It's about relationships. A servant heart. Servant spirit. Third base is the competence base. It's the performance base. It's, it's being competent to do the thing that you've been, called, you've been called to do. God put man in the garden to work it and take care of it. Doing what God's called you to do. So here's the diamond life. Home plate is your power and pur the power and purpose of your life. First base is the, the personal base. It's winning within. Second base is winning with others. It's the community base. Third base is the competence base. It's winning over obstacles. And you have first, second, third, and home. Okay? The pattern of the world is to force things. And what God wants to do is bring us from self-reliance to spirit reliance. His pattern. So from self, moving from self-reliance to spirit reliance makes us candidates for his favor. 
makes us candidates for his favor. Which means you never have to cheat to fulfill God's calling and purpose in your life. So here's the question for us. Which way do you reflectively run the bases? Now here, here's, here's kind of what's happened uh, in the last uh, 20 years in the church world. We, we heard this, this thing from, the, 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 from all the leadership gurus 20 years ago, the John Maxwells of the world and others, that it's about third base. That, that third base matters. Well, what, what happened with a lot of guys, they ran from home plate to third and back home and called it a score. See? And that's why we have a lot of shipwrecks in the ministry. Because the order of the bases matters. Now, we also had, 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 had a movement afloat that, that said, you know, it's all about first base. It's all about character and prayer and all those things. Third base doesn't matter. But I'm here to tell you, you have to go to three bases to score a run. The character base is the first base. But you don't stop there. Now, let me just say this, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings when I say this. But I've heard from the time I was a small kid in, in the Assemblies of God, well, you know, brother so-and-so, church never was much. He just, but you know what? He was faithful. And my question is, faithful to do what? Is showing up every week enough? See, because the confidence base does matter. The home plate is the calling and purpose. The power plate, it's about spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership. There is no substitute from hearing from God. There is no substitute from seeking God. There is no substitute from responding to the promptings of the Spirit. That's what spiritual leadership is all about. We hear a lot about leadership, but I want to tell you what, there's no substitute for spiritual leadership. It's getting on God's anointed agenda. It's hearing the voice of the Spirit. There's a universal call that's come to every one of us from the Holy Spirit. But there's a call that comes to all of us individually from the Lord. God always grants His power for His purpose. An on-purpose church is an extension of an on-purpose pastor. So home plate deals with, with really what it means to be a spiritual leader. God's calling and purpose in your life. First base, the character base. The baseline for this is truth. And a lot of people in the ministry, there's always something brewing beneath the surface that continues to sabotage people in ministry. And the Lord says, the, the truth will make, make you free. The truth will set you free. You will know the truth. It's the character base. Second base, the community base. The baseline here is trust. Trust. So a first base 
the baseline is truth. Second base, the baseline is trust. The ability to get people to trust you. Pastor came up to me at, uh, before we started this afternoon. He said, I'm, I'm getting ready to go pastor a church. I've been involved in a parachurch ministry and, you know, and, uh, and he said, he, and he asked me a question, what do you recommend I do when I get there to pastor that church at the very beginning? I said, spend one year loving people and preach the word. Don't go in there and try to change the world. You have to earn the right to lead before you can lead. Yeah. And you earn the right to lead by building trust. Now, and people, and God said to me, well, how long does it take to get trust? I said, it depends on how bad it was before you got there. <laughs> because I know situations where there is no respect left for spiritual leadership in the house. You don't start at ground zero, you start below that. So I don't know how, to, how long it takes to earn trust, but I know you gotta earn trust before you can take people anywhere. So you gotta, you gotta love people and get them with you before you take them somewhere. So how do you win with others? Trust. Building trust. The levels of leadership, you've heard John Maxwell do those levels of leadership. We teach this in, in different settings in the journey. The five levels of leadership, I remember, remember seeing that. Uh, anyway, there's a whole new book he's just written right now just on that chart. That's how important it is. He's just got a brand new book just on the chart that he had in his first book 25 years ago. On the five levels of leadership. I... Uh, I did an interim pastor, um, finished a year and a half ago in Fresno, California. People's Church, Fresno, California. G.L. Johnson no. built a great church there from, from about 100 people to 5,000 over 40 years. He called me up on the phone six months before his 80th birthday. And he said, Ron, I got to retire. I said, that's a good, good idea. <laughs> he said, I have no succession plan. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have no idea what, what I'm going to do about the church after 40 years. And so I flew into Fresno. We spent some time together. And I began to put together a, a, a plan, a succession plan for that church and that pastor. Six months later, we had a retirement celebration with him, and I became the, the consistent voice in that pulpit for two years every weekend. While we helped that people, that, that congregation walk through a grieving process in their pastor's res retirement and get ready for the future. 5,000 plus people. The good news is we have a pastor there today, and the church is doing well, and I'm grateful. It's the sixth one I've done like that in 10 years. And so far, all of them are doing well. But G.L. Johnson passed away six months ago, 82. And I had the honor of being a part of his uh, funeral service. Dr. George Wood was there and spoke, and other great leaders were there and spoke. On the day of his funeral, <coughs> The lead story for all four networks in the fourth largest city in California, the lead story from all four networks was G.L. Johnson's funeral today. The Fresno Bee, the newspaper that had, has a circulation of three million, the front cover of the Fresno Bee was the story of G.L. Johnson's life and ministry that son. Talk about legacy. Talk about trust. Here's a man who earned the right to lead people.
by his character and by his ability to demonstrate that people could trust him. That's why, Pastor, when you promise things that you don't deliver, trust keeps dropping. Don't get up and say things that you're not prepared to do because your credibility just keeps dropping. You gotta, if you're going to be successful in ministry, you've got to win the community base. You've got to win the baseline, the trust fund. It's about people leadership. The difference between lording over people, dominating them, or leading them, and dignifying them. There was a day when we had the, a model of, of church leadership, which was a, you know, Adolf Hitler model. Everybody hunker down. The king of the world just walked in the door. He's called our pastor. This, today, that style of leadership doesn't work. So if you want everybody to bow down and, and pay homage to you, you probably might go see that happen today. But, but leadership is about helping people walk with you into a future that God has planned for them and you. The hierarchical style of leadership doesn't grow people very well. It doesn't develop others. <coughs> I've worked with churches like that. The third base is the competence base, the performance base. And the baseline here is training. It's performance leadership. And the question is, do results matter to God? And the answer is yes. You read your word and you will discover that results do matter to God. Why did he curse a fig tree? Besides the analogy he was using. Because it wasn't bearing fruit. It wasn't bearing fruit. Results do matter to God. The second question, is God shrewd? You better believe it. You know what the Lord said? He said, I wish, I wish that my people would function in my system the way the world functions in theirs. In the world system, smart people take advantage of every opportunity in the world system to make it and to succeed. And the Lord says, I wish my people would function in my system the way the world functions in theirs. What does that mean? I wish my people would take advantage of what I'm offering them. Of blessing, of provision, of promise. I wish my people would take advantage of what I've, I'm giving them. But we live like paupers, and I'm not talking about money. We live like paupers spiritually. We live with a scarcity paradigm. Yeah. You know what a scarcity paradigm is? Well, it's just so much, and you just have to hold on to what you got. Did you know that's anti-kingdom? It's anti-kingdom. The kingdom is about releasing what's in your hands, not, not holding what's in your hands. What I give is the only thing I get to keep. What I give is what comes back to me. Pressed down, shaking together, and running over. Read that somewhere. That's why cheap, stingy preachers can't figure out why they, their boards are cheap and stingy. When I went to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and we had our first, the first guest uh, I had in my pulpit there, and I, had, I asked Henry to write out a check an honorarium check for that guest, I thought Henry was going, well, his eyeballs were going to pop out of his head. He said, Pastor, we've never given a guest anything like that. I said, well, we, we are now. Because you see, that board that hired me to be their pastor, they're the tightest crowd I had ever seen. I mean, they, they wanted to pay me as little as they could. 
when they told me the number, of course, you know, I was coming no matter what because I knew that's where God wanted me to be. So money's never decided where I went. Let's just get that clear. Money's never decided what I do. But they, they told me what they were going to pay me. I said, oh, I, I didn't know you wanted that kind of preacher. <laughs> if, you, if that's what you want, I can find you a dozen of those. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> I was 31, too, you know. <laughs> stupid. 31 is stupid. But the Lord says, I, I, I want you to ha have, a, have a, an abundance paradigm, not a scarcity paradigm. So, so you know what? I started blessing people and blessing guests and blessing those around me as a pastor. Did you know within a couple of years, the members of our board wanted to start blessing me? Go figure. You get, pastor, what you are. If you want to be tight and cheap, then don't, don't expect the people around you to be generous with you. Is this mic on? <laughs> God says, I want you to use the system I've put in place to bless your life, to bless your ministry, to bless everything. I want, I want you to take advantage of the system of the kingdom of God as well as the world works and operates on their system. Results do matter to God. Competence does matter. And then the whole plate is the success base. It's going from success to significance with your life. So. When you look at that whole paradigm there, let me just put the, tie some things together. When you look at the bases, the temptation is to, to either run to first and back home and call it a score, or go to third base and come home and call it a score. Politicians go to second base and come home and call it a score. You see, this is not multiple choice. God wants to work in all of these arenas in our lives to effectively do what he called us to do. Win within. Win with people. Be a competent leader. Remember what I said, you don't score unless you go to all three bases. Remember? If you run the bases backwards, it's called Little League. And you can't run to any one of the bases and back home and call it a score. So that's the deal. In 1988, our church had seen a great deal of success. We were in five Sunday services. Building a brand new 2,500 seat auditorium. Which took two and a half years under construction. And one of the biggest nightmares of my life. When the contractor walks out on you about two thirds of the way with all your money. And as a brother, yeah. makes you not want to do business with Christians. He's a brother. I don't mean a physical brother. He's a Christian brother. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for a banker that believed in me and my vision, I'd never got the building finished. So I was doing five Sunday services. I was trying to get a building bit finished. I was trying to raise all the money we needed to, to move into it. We were hurt. And finally we got in the building. Dedication Sunday. 
Sunday morning, first Sunday in, the place was jammed from the balance seats. Well, I had, had the dedication schedule for Sunday afternoon. I had the governor there. I had the mayor there. I had our congressman there. The only people that weren't there were our church people. Oh, my God. I mean, you could shoot a cannon through the place and not hit a soul. I was so embarrassed I couldn't see straight. They all were there in the morning. But they didn't come to the dedication. I was so ticked off. <laughs> you know, we had these beautiful, beautiful brochures, you know, with all the, the, the stats and they, all the great things and so forth, you know. And, and uh, the next Sunday, I uh, said to people, I said, on your behalf, last Sunday, we dedicated this building. <laughs> if you're interested in what we might have done on your behalf, there are, the brochures are out on the, on the tables as you're going out the four years today. And the ushers told me, he said, people would look around and see if anybody was looking and grip a brochure. You know, and didn't want anybody to know they weren't, weren't the ones there. You know. So it was crazy. It was just crazy. And we started one of the nightmares of my life, and that was uh, pastoring a group of people that were like the children of Israel and all of a sudden in a moment. Now the church was bigger than they thought it was because it was the size of their service and the other building that sat full, that would seat 400. So I had three congregations I was bringing back together into one service, at least three congregations, maybe four. And they didn't know each other. They didn't even like each other. And it, it was just unbelievable. Of course, when that happens, everything gets tight financially. And I told God I was done. I've enjoyed all this, I understand. <laughs> One Monday morning, I got in my car, put my jeans on and a sweatshirt, got in my car and started driving. I was gonna to drive to the edge of the city limits to make, just to see how that felt. <laughs> but that morning, I wrote a letter of resignation to my church. I also addressed an envelope and put my ordination card in an envelope and addressed it to the district office. That's how far gone I was. I was done. I was totally emotionally done. I came to myself on a park bench, remember as long as I live, Shaftner Park, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I had the envelopes with me. And I said, God, I'm done. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I just don't, I ain't doing this anymore. And God came and sat down next to me on that bench. As I said before, there's only about four or five times in my life where I know God showed up in a sovereign way in my life, and this was another one of those moments. I mean, no, when you have a pity party, the devil brings the balloons and whistles to a pity party. That's where it was. And the Lord spoke to me that day. And he said some very hard things to me. He said, uh, you spent all these years building your church. Why don't you build mine? Because this has been your church, not mine. Secondly, what I need you to know is if it's ever my will for you to leave this place, it'll be in victory, not defeat. <clears throat> so if you decide you're going to let this be my church, then there's some changes going to have to be made. He outlined what those changes were going to have to be for me. Yeah. Yeah. It was tough. And what the Lord said to me that day,
reminded me of a verse of scripture. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know you don't think God curses, but he does when he talks to me. He said, uh, he said, all this crap has nothing to do with me. Don't you blame it on me? All of this stress, all of this burnout is self-inflicted. It has to do with you trying to do my job and yours both. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what do you want? Your way or my way? And that day, some decisions were made that changed, changed my life. That's why today when I tell you that all this matters, it does. And what you do and how you handle it all determines success or failure. God doesn't want you to live another day weighted down for stuff. I don't want anything on me that he don't want on me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And you can find rest for your soul. I believe that the Lord wants us to lead churches today from a seated position. From a place of recognition that it's not just about my energy and my effort, it's about Him. We have been seated together with Christ in heavenly places. As a result of that, we can work, walk worthy of the calling by which we've been called. See, it's, it's a paradox, but but you to walk from a seated position with a recognition that it's his church. See, I start, that's why I started talking to people that I started dealing with with problems and issues. I said, you know what? The Lord's not going to let that go on in his church. I might let it go on in mine, but God's not going to let this go on in his. I'm here to represent him today. People don't know what to do with that. His church. It's his church. I said it's his church. And he's got some thoughts about it. He's got some ideas about it. He's got some plans for his church. And what's everything we're talking about? about? It's about finding out what he wants how to do what he's called us to do. Character, community, competence, calling. Truth, trust, training, all of those words us to become the person God's called us to be. With a recognition at home plates about my calling and my purpose. 
and that all of it is a result of what he's done, not me. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody ought to get rest and relief from that today. Lord, I just pray that you would relieve us of everything that's not of you. Lord, you know the battles and the struggles some of us are facing in this room. Lord, you know today some of the things that are going on back home that we feel helpless about. But I'm thankful, Lord, that if we would just respond to the promptings of your spirit and do what you say, that you will build your church. And hell will not prevail against that church. And so, Lord, I just pray that today you would just seal that in our hearts, that none of us would miss what you're saying to us in this moment. We just give you praise for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen? Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Let's have lunch. <laughs>